the last 32 years have been horrendous. They still are, and they always will be. The murder of 11-year-old Leslie Molseed casts a long shadow. You're numb because you keep coming back to the fact that Lel's never coming home. It was a horrific crime that destroyed three families. This is the man that had killed my sister. Uh, and this is the last face that Lel had seen. I can't erase the past. I wish I could. It tears me apart some days. And it played on the mind of one man for more than 30 years. When he thought the front door was going in his dreams, or he thought there was someone in the garden, he thought they were coming for him. He lived a very unhappy, deviant and dark life. The discovery of Leslie Moleseed's body here on Rishworth Moor in West Yorkshire was sensational news back in October 1975. And more than three decades later, her death was in the headlines again when her murderer was finally brought to justice. But what about the years in between? Well, they were filled with drama and a flawed police investigation that led to one of Britain's most infamous miscarriages of justice. So how did detectives arrest the wrong man, condemning him to prison for a crime he did not commit? And how, so many years later, did police finally identify the real killer? In 1975, the Molseed family were living on the Turf Hill estate in Rochdale. Leslie was the youngest of four children. She had a brother, Freddie, and two sisters, Julie and Laura. She was bubbly so chatty, so full of life and really was mischievous. One of the most gorgeous little creatures you will ever know. She was a lovely kid. Beautiful child, really beautiful. October the 5th began like any other Sunday at number 11 Delamere Road. The children's stepfather, Danny, was at work and their mum, April, was making a start on lunch. Through my mind went, oh, you don't have any bread. So I looked at the wee rotor and I thought, who's next? And it was Leslie. So I called her in. Leslie! I says, Leslie, Dan, will you go and get me a loaf? And she says, yes, no problem. Don't be long! I was upstairs folding the clothes and I shared it through the window. I said, where are you going? I said to the shop and that. I said, OK, I'll see you. The last I saw of her was uh, at the bottom of the road, turn and gone, and that was the last time I saw my daughter. Leslie left home at about 12.30. As she headed to the shops, she was spotted by a number of neighbours. The last sighting of Leslie is probably going into Stay Ups Lane. Stay Ups Lane is a high-sided lane that makes its way up to the only shops that would have been open to Leslie for her to go on on that day. And I think anybody visiting that scene would say that's a very good point for a possible abduction. I don't know if it was about half an hour to an hour, and I said to mum, she's not back. Lel's not back yet, so um, that's when mum sent us out to have a look for him. I was at my boyfriend's, and I thought, I'll go and visit my mum and that, so I went down to Stipes Lane, and I just crossed Turf Hill Road, and there was my brother, Fred, and he was running, and I said, oh, where are you off, Fred? He said, oh, Lel went to the shop over an hour ago, and she's not come back. So I quickly marched round and my mum was at the gate at that particular time looking out and I said, Mum, what's going on? She looked really drawn, really, really worried. I was expecting to find her. The fact that I couldn't, you know, the panic set in and I thought, I, I just never thought I wouldn't find her. Next thing you know, I bumped into Danny, stepdad, 
And we were going down Stipes Lane and he was going absolutely frantic. We were going in and out of gardens, opening up sheds and shouting for her. And then the neighbours got to hear that she'd gone missing and they were coming out. And you can only imagine the uh, sense of terror that there must have been actually on this day as the hours unfolded. She would stop and talk to people and all that. So you could trace Lel's steps by the people that she talked to. But she wasn't talking to anybody. In the days that followed, as the police search widened, Leslie's family began to fear the worst. I went into meltdown. I was useless to anybody, even myself. Completely and utterly useless. I went numb. And although I was only 16 at the time, I knew something bad had happened. And um, I could always remember it was Tuesday morning and uh, Mum was upstairs. She was actually sat up in Lyle's bed and she had a whole pair of uh, the old American black and white baseball boots. And uh, she just put them down on the bedside table and I put the cup of tea there. And she said, she's never going to wear them again, Julie. And I said, no, no, Mum, she's not. And we both burst into tears and just started crying. So we knew then that Lyle was never coming home. Those fears were confirmed three days later when Leslie's body was found on Rishworth Moor in West Yorkshire, 10 miles from where she had lived. She'd been stabbed 12 times. And most of those stab wounds were around the, um, the shoulder and upper back area. Some of them were very fierce. The knife had been driven up to the hilt and one indeed did go through Leslie's heart. She was fully clothed. Her body had possibly been posed. Her, her knickers were on show. And it was quite apparent there was semen staining on Leslie's vest, on her skirt and on her knickers. The details of Leslie's brutal murder spread fear and suspicion through the community. The rumour would have gone round immediately that a stranger had snatched Leslie off the streets and then so something approaching some form of hysteria really can build up. I think inevitably there is a great downward pressure on the officers, on the senior officers uh, and then down to the officers on the street. They want to get a result, they want to get this person off the street. As the days and weeks and months went on that uh, Leslie's killer hadn't been caught, then uh, everybody locally became a suspect. This is uh, not a thing that can be solved quickly uh, unless there is some sudden breakthrough as a result of information from the public. But with no specific breakthrough, the police turned their attention to anyone in the community who aroused suspicion generally. Their inquiries led them to a 23-year-old inland revenue clerk called Stefan Kishko. Stefan was the son of Ukrainian migrants and he was rather a simple soul as a child. He looked odd, he was quite large for his age, he was quite timid and rather a mummy's boy really. When he was 18 he was walking home with his father, Ivan, and uh, Ivan collapsed and died in the street. Now Ivan was about the only male influence on his life really and uh, when his father died, Stefan became even closer to his mum and really did cling to her apron strings. As a social misfit, Kishko was an easy target for local suspicions and he'd been accused, wrongly, of indecent exposure by three young girls. On December the 21st, 1975, police took him in for questioning about the Molseed murder. Over the next three days, he was to become their prime suspect. When 23-year-old Stefan Kishko was taken in for questioning, police believed they'd found the killer of Leslie Molseed. He was extremely naive and ingenuous and very trusting. And he would have been very vulnerable at the time of his arrest. Before the Police and Criminal Evidence Act of 1984, a solicitor did not have to be present when police interviewed a suspect. And Kishko was questioned without one over the next three days. It was just before Christmas when he was arrested. I think the, the officers must have thought that Christmas had come a couple of days early. Stefan arrived gift wrapped for them. None of us were in that room. We don't know what went on. And he did emerge as a good circumstantial local suspect. There was no doubt about that. 
While questioning Kishko, the police made several discoveries which convinced them they had the right man. The detectives established that he had an apparent interest in pornography, also that he had a, a medical condition for which he'd been receiving uh, testosterone treatment. He suffered from something called hypogonadism, which is that the male testes haven't descended, so he's sexually immature, sexually inactive. So the GP um, just prescribed him testosterone jabs. So he took uh, the jabs in the arm and um, it made him sexually active at 23, the first time ever. Kishko told police the injections had triggered new sexual feelings, leading him to buy pornography. But they claimed they'd triggered something much more powerful, uncontrollable sexual urges that had turned him into a child killer. Tell us where you were. Then came the moment that sealed Kishko's fate. Under the pressure of intense questioning, he suddenly confessed to murdering Leslie Molseed. He seemed to be under the impression that if he admitted it, gave them what they wanted, he would be allowed home and, and then it would all get sorted out. Knowing that he, of course, was innocent. Uh, what, what, whatever was going through his mind, it was a dreadful, dreadful mistake. Finally allowed access to a solicitor, Kishko retracted his confession, but by then the police had made up their minds, and on Christmas Eve, they charged him with murder. With Kishko remanded in custody, police were convinced they had the right man behind bars, so they made no connection when another crime happened a few months later, less than a mile from where Leslie had been abducted, even though it bore chilling similarities. On July the 3rd, 1976, part-time taxi driver Ronald Castry was charged with a sexual assault on a young girl, then released on bail. That night, the 22-year-old went home to his wife and told her what he'd done. It was the early hours of the morning. It was past his shift and everything. And I, he came in and he said, right, you can divorce me now. And I said, why would I want to do that? And he said, I'm in trouble, Bev. I've interfered with the child. The police have had me in. It happened in a street in Rochdale's Turf Hill Estate, the same area where Leslie Molseed had been abducted before her murder. Two nine-year-old girls were playing together in the street. Despite confusing statements by the pair, police were later able to establish that a man had approached them both in his car. That man was Ronald Castry. One of the girls fled in fear, but Castry managed to get her friend into his car and drove away. It would appear that the girl was taken to a derelict house, had some of her clothing removed, and that uh, Castry uh, ejaculated and probably uh, had a little girl touch him. So it was a very serious sexual offence. The girl managed to escape and ran home to tell her mother, who immediately called the police. Castry was arrested and pleaded guilty a week later. But despite the seriousness of the offence, the punishment was shockingly lenient. It's incredible to think that in July 1976, for an offence of indecent assault and gross indecency on a nine-year-old girl, the penalty at Rochdale Magistrates Court was £25 fine. Such a light sentence made it easy for Castry's crime to be brushed under the carpet. His protective parents insisted to his confused wife it was an aberration, the result of a breakdown, and completely out of character. I was shocked, stunned, not quite sure what kind of a person he was, but then again, I was only young myself. And to take all that in and have his parents fuss around going, he'll be all right, Ronnie will be all right, you know, he's seeking treatment and everything, he's just working too hard. And then, of course, life carried on. Beverly had met Castry in 1971, when she was just 16 and he was 18. They started dating, and within three months, they were engaged. But even then, it was a far from perfect relationship. I knew he was seeing other girls, even when we were engaged, even before we got married. But they'll deny it, won't they? Till the dying day, till the last breath, they'll deny it. Oh, you don't know what you're talking about, Bev. Come back when you do, you know. And and then at that age, 16, 17, 18, you think, oh, well, he won't do it again, you know. So 
stupid here, went and married him at 18, thinking, I knew it all. How wrong was I? The violence didn't come out until after we were married. But he did have a fiery temper. Well, I'd never met anyone with such a fiery temper before. One time he picked me up by the breasts and threw me down the corridor. I was, as a result of that, I was all bruised. And that was just one of many incidents recorded on the doctor's records. Castry's behaviour drove Beverly to have a brief affair of her own and she fell pregnant by her lover. In September 1975, she gave birth to a son, but a minor complication saw her and the baby readmitted to hospital on October the 3rd, just two days before Leslie Molseed's disappearance. It's probable that Ronald Castry was angry at the birth of his first son that he knew not to be his. He was only 21. His wife was back in hospital and uh, kept in there, so he was home alone. He therefore had the, the opportunity and maybe a motive. But at the time, the police weren't examining the opportunities and motives of others. They were focused solely on Stefan Kishko, whose trial for Leslie Molseed's murder began on July the 7th, 1976. The first time I actually saw Stefan Kishko was at the murder trial in 76. And I can remember looking down on him and thinking, God, he's so tall, he's so big. How could he have done that to my sister? Kishko now vehemently denied any involvement in the murder, but his lawyers knew it was going to be hard to undo the damage done by his initial confession. As a result, they decided to run two alternative defence arguments. The first was that their client hadn't committed the murder. The second was that if he had done, it was due to mental illness brought on by the testosterone injections he'd been receiving. As I understand it, the specialist who had actually prescribed those drugs was available to the defence, and he'd made it clear to them that that was arrant nonsense. But this was ignored in the defence claim of diminished responsibility, which to the jury may have appeared as effectively an admission of guilt. It seems to me that once the defence were pushing that to the forefront of the mind of the jury, then the jury, like the public, would think that they'd got the right man. Two weeks later, the jury at Leeds Crown Court rejected both defence arguments and returned a verdict of guilty. Stefan Kishko was sentenced to life in prison. Stefan was already being escorted back down the stairs. The court was in an uproar. In my eyes, that, that there was, was the person that had killed my Lil, my sister Lil, and that's where he should be, in prison, and I never wanted him to get out. It's something you just can't put into words. You're numb because you keep coming back to the fact that Lel's never coming home. And he, Stefan, was the last face that she'd seen. And all these things were going through your mind. Kishko was taken to Armley Prison in Leeds to begin his life sentence as a convicted child murderer. He went through horrendous experiences inside prison in terms of bullying other inmates. And, of course, the one thing they always said to him was, the only way that you'll ever get parole is if you confess to this murder and that you did in 1975. And Kishko would never, ever admit to it. He was physically and, and verbally abused and abused in all sorts of unpleasant ways. And the effect of those experiences were um, to make him, make him ill and, and gradually he became more and more mentally ill. In May 1978, Kishko's appeal was rejected. Isolated in prison for his own protection, he now faced the prospect of a life behind bars. But his mother, Charlotte, refused to give up hope and waged a one-woman campaign to prove her son was innocent. This was one determined little lady. She was going to have a day when her son would walk out of jail. No matter how long it took, she would you know, fight and fight and fight. British justice, we always say is the best, and it lets you so down. She was passionately determined to find somebody who would prove her son's innocence. 
Charlotte Kishko contacted anyone she believed could possibly help her cause, including Mrs Thatcher and the Queen. She finally found a sympathetic ear in Solicitor Campbell Malone. The more that I looked at the case, and the more that I spoke to other people who had also looked at the case, the more I just developed the feeling that there was something terribly wrong. There was one man, though, who knew for certain that Kishko was innocent, but he remained silent. By the mid-1980s, Ronald Castry and his wife Beverly had three children, but the appearance of conventional family life disguised a catalogue of abuse. I'd describe my dad as being split personality. It'd be all right to everybody outside, but to us, it'd be psychological uh, violence towards me, physical violence towards my mum. He had to tread around on eggshells all the time, and he did have guns for a certain amount of time. Um, and by this time, he drank an awful lot. He'd down a bottle of whiskey a night, and then mixed with painkillers as well. It was like a time bomb waiting to go off. He was totally weird in the bedroom department. He had washing lines, canes, <laughs> box of tricks, you know. He always had a keen interest in school girls and he wanted my mum to dress up in school girls' uniforms and because my mum wasn't that way inclined, he'd open the say in front of us kids, well, I'll go out and find someone to do it. So that would lead him, lead him to prostitution. Castry was a regular user of prostitutes over the years, but there was a much darker side to his sexual fantasies, which had disturbing echoes of his previous conviction. The family holidays were taken at the same place. Uh, we went there for a number of years. We didn't realise why in the beginning. It was only as the boys got older we all realised together that he was taking an interest in the young girls. He'd send us lads off swimming and he'd be stood there in the pool, main pool, ogling at the girls. One time we were quite close to another couple and the two daughters and he made them feel so uncomfortable, they moved. You cringe, you're embarrassed, you just want to curl up and die. Ronald Castry may have been enjoying his freedom, but without his knowledge, events were unfolding that would soon put him in fear. The man doing time for the murder he had committed was about to be declared innocent. When Stefan Kishko was convicted of Leslie Molseed's murder in 1976, there seemed no doubt that a dangerous killer had been put behind bars. But Kishko's mother, Charlotte, fought tirelessly to prove his innocence, enlisting the support of solicitor Campbell Malone. His efforts led to West Yorkshire Police re-examining the case in 1991. They uncovered crucial evidence that had been locked away in the archives of the Forensic Science Service for 16 years. And it would cast dramatic new light on the case. The police came to see us and they gave us a background as to what the new evidence was, that the world was led to believe was new evidence. What the police had discovered were notes taken by a forensic scientist at the time of the original inquiry. What we know now, and what should have been known then, and possibly may have been known then, was that the, the, the semen taken from Stefan did not match the semen which was found on the body. Stefan Kishko had a condition in, by which he could never produce sperm heads in his semen. Never. It was always known from the early days of, of 1975, from the first examinations, that the semen staining on Leslie did contain sperm heads. It would appear that that matter didn't get an airing that it should have done at Leeds Crown Court. Stefan Kishko had been cheated out of 16 years of his life. This vital piece of evidence would have proved his innocence beyond doubt, but was not disclosed by police and was never asked for by the defence. The forensic scientist and the surviving senior police officer were later charged with perverting the course of justice. But the case against them was dropped on the grounds that the passage of time made a fair trial impossible.
I think that uh, as an investigation it was at the least incompetent. Um, I fear it may have been something worse. I have no reason to believe that the officers targeted and then pursued some of their new to be innocent. I think they'd become convinced by everything they saw about Stefan that they'd got the right man and they didn't want to know about anything that didn't fit that. For Stefan Kishko, 16 years of wrongful imprisonment came to an end on February the 17th, 1992, when the Court of Appeal finally quashed his conviction. I've never had an emotion like that before or since. It, uh, and I knew it was coming. Uh, it wasn't as though there was any doubt about the verdict. But it had been so long and there had been so much suffering for Stefan and his family. Uh, it was a physical sensation that I was only just able to control. But the years of incarceration had taken their toll on Kishko's physical and mental health. It's been a nightmare situation, to be honest with you. Prison's been very difficult. The whole situation in the police station was a very difficult one, and the whole situation just has been intolerable. He struggled when he came out. He had a lot of difficulty coping. I feel angry towards the police, the way they handled all of this. Why? Because they should never have arrested me. They should have arrested the right person. People were extraordinarily nice with him. And the nicer they were, the harder he found it, because it brought it all back. What are your hopes now for the future? My hopes for the future to get married, go on holiday and enjoy my life as much as I can. It was not to be. On December the 23rd, 1993, 18 months after his release, Stefan Kishko suffered a heart attack and died. His mother, Charlotte, died four months later. I felt they were cheated. I would have liked them to have had longer together. Before she died, Charlotte said to me that I was to promise not to let people forget Stefan's name or what was done to him. I will always try to keep by that promise. For the family of Leslie Molseed, Kishko's release marked the beginning of a new ordeal. I'd hated this man for so long and now they're telling me that this man wasn't, hadn't done it and there was somebody else out there who had actually killed Lel and just I couldn't accept it. Even to this day, it's still there. You know, I had 16 years of living with Kisco, killed my daughter. And it's still, everybody, you know, people keep talking about, oh, uh, you were a poor lad and all that. But I kind of get that. I'm very upset about Kisco spending 16 years in prison for the murder he didn't do. There's somewhere out there is a man who killed my sister. And the, the police, I hope to God they catch him because I'll never arrest them until they do. None of us arrest. None of us in sacked all us. It brought it to the forefront of my mind what had happened to Lel, what she'd gone through. So you started all over again. Lel, Lesser Cotton Socks had been murdered again. I appeal to any person who has any information that could assist the police in any way to come forward. Two families have been the victims of this murder, mine and Mr. Kisco. And if anybody can help her anguish over Leslie's murder, please come forward. A new hunt to find Leslie's killer was now underway. The first thing you do is clear the ground from under your feet. So you go back to 1975 and you say, well, what evidence, what information did we have at that time? And a number of potential suspects emerged from that data troll. Several men were questioned by police, but by the mid-90s, the investigation had stalled. Desperate to see the killer brought to justice, Leslie's family took to the streets with their own campaign to remind people of the little girl who had been murdered back in 1975. People forget at times that that little girl is dead. I mean, she's my little girl, and I think about her day in and day out. This man has got to be brought to justice. With such a frustrating lack of progress, West Yorkshire Police launched a cold case review, 
under the leadership of Detective Chief Superintendent Max McLean. We always knew that this was a very sensitive and important case for West Yorkshire Police. Uh, we knew that we, uh, amongst others, had got it badly wrong in 1975 and uh, it was something that meant a lot to us. It, we knew we couldn't put the, uh, turn the clock back but we desperately wanted to try and put it right and the, the way in which we could do that was of course by finding the real killer. Aware of how badly let down by the police Leslie's family felt, one of McLean's first priorities was to go and meet them and attempt to win back their trust. I can remember realising the importance of the first impressions we gave to April and uh, other members of Leslie's family. I told Mr McLean that I didn't think I would ever see the killer of Leslie in my lifetime. That's, and he said, yes, you will. I remember introducing Sergeant Hepworth, Veronica Hepworth, as the family liaison officer. That was a, a, a very, very um, interesting meeting, to say the least. Um, April, her uh, first words to me was, well, you've got your work cut out, girl. So we knew that the reputation of West Yorkshire Police wasn't at its highest with Leslie's family. Lacking any new lines of inquiry, McLean was determined to leave no stone unturned. I went up to Weatherby Laboratory and I spoke to scientists up there about the potential for reviewing the forensic evidence in the case. And we established that uh, there was only one thing remaining uh, in all the exhibits, in all the case, uh, and that was an envelope. And that envelope contained some sellotape tapings. At the time of the original examination, the surface of Leslie Molseed's clothing would have been taped, so they would have got strips of sellotape and pressed them down onto the garments and lifted them off to collect any fibres that might have transferred to them. The discovery was fortunate and it had the potential to be hugely significant. We knew at that time semen had been found on Leslie Molseed's pants, so there were some thoughts around is there a possibility that some of the semen could have also lifted up off onto the sellotape. And it was put to me that it might be possible to extract that semen and obtain a DNA profile. But it was by no means a certainty. This was uncharted territory for the Forensic Science Service. A DNA profile had never been obtained in this way before, so scientists experimented with dummy strips of sellotape. Once confident of their method, they went to work on the originals. They only had one chance to do it right as the process would destroy the tape. Their first success came with the discovery of sperm heads in the material they'd extracted from the tape. Then came the result police and forensic scientists had hoped for, a DNA profile of the killer of Leslie Molseed. This was such a big breakthrough. This was a case that at that time was 25 years old. It was the oldest case that we'd ever worked on and it was the first time this type of technology had been applied to that type of retained material. So it really was very, very exciting. Police began collating DNA samples, keeping the existence of this crucial new piece of information secret so as not to alert the killer. But as the months and then years passed and no match was found, the family's hopes began to fade. I thought, we are never going to find out who it is. Why is he not in the database? Has he thought, oh, cocky, got away with killing our Lel? If you're over the age of about 30, the name Leslie Molseed may be familiar to you. Her face became a poignant symbol of child murder. In February 2003, Max McLean used a television appeal to publicly announce the existence of the DNA profile for the first time. All we need is a name. After 28 years, we will never have a better chance of catching the killer of Leslie Molseed. That was hugely successful in terms of public response, but of course it didn't give us the name of Ronald Charles Edward Castry. Since 1990, Castry had been running a comic book shop in ashton under -Lyne. At the time, his chosen business raised no suspicions, but his motives have now been cast in a new light. 
we wonder whether that particular type of occupation does give him access to, to, to children and, and to, to the world of fantasy. It was his cover. He was a well-known businessman, respected, but then he had a dark secret. After Leslie's murder, you see that he, he lived a very unhappy, deviant and dark life. And I think that tells a lot about the man. Throughout the years, he was very jumpy and we could never fathom out why in the middle of the night he would, he would leap out of bed and bed the someone in the garden. He was always paranoid, he was always on edge. I believe that in his mind, on all these occasions, when he thought the front door was going in his dreams, or he thought there was someone in the garden, he thought they were coming for him. And then when we had horrendous arguments over things, I'd say, what is the matter with you? And he'd go, if only you knew, Bev. I, I never suspected. And I'd say, if only I knew what? And he'd go, leave it, Bev, leave it. You're like a dog with a bone. L just leave it. Castry's 26-year marriage to Beverly finally ended in 1997. By then, he had evaded justice for 22 years, and he must have believed the police would never catch up with him. But as he began his new life, his dark sexual secrets and his use of prostitutes were to prove his undoing. Thirty years after the murder of Leslie Molseed, West Yorkshire police had a DNA profile of her killer, but no match. Then, on October the 1st, 2005, Ronald Castry was accused of rape by a prostitute and later arrested. Although the police didn't charge him, new laws allowed them to take a routine DNA swab. And this was the moment when Castry's lifetime of lies finally unravelled. When the Forensic Science Service next ran the DNA profile of Leslie's killer through the database, they discovered they had a perfect match. I got a phone call from Cathy Turner at the lab who asked me if I was sitting down and at first what she told me didn't sink in. Um, and, she, and she said the name of Ronald Castry and it didn't mean at that time anything to me. I was very quickly briefed on a, a couple of very important factors about Ronald Castry. He lived locally, only three quarters of a mile away from where Leslie was probably abducted. He had a conviction for a sexual offence that was quite similar in its method used to the abduction and killing of Leslie. And that he was a taxi driver and therefore had access to vehicles. So there was three very important factors that were immediately brought to my attention and of course were of great interest to us. The DNA match really was just the start of the research work that we had to then undertake and prove that Leslie Molseed had been killed by Ronald Castry. By November the 5th, 2006, the police were convinced that, at long last, they had the right man. They were ready to make their arrest. Are you Ronald Charles Edward Castro? I am. Right, listen very carefully okay. to what I've got to say to you now. You were under arrest for the murder of Leslie Susan Molsey. You're joking. Between 12 noon on Sunday the 5th of October 1975 and 4.6.45am on Wednesday the 8th of October 1975. Do you understand the caution? Uh, yes, I understand the caution. Your arrest is necessary for the prompt and effective investigation of the offence. It's ridiculous. That same morning, Leslie's family were told the news they'd waited more than 30 years to hear. Oh, my God. I don't know how to, what to say to you. It was just... My God, I can't believe it. Are you sure? Are you 100% sure this is the man? I was over the moon. I really was. Gobsmacked, I think, is a term I would use. I don't think April ever thought that she would see a positive uh, match to the DNA profile in her lifetime. But there was another family for whom news of the arrest was a devastating blow. When they said that, we've got your dad on suspicion of murder. <laughs> My world just fell apart. 
I said, are you sure? And they went, as sure as we'll ever be. And then I felt incredibly angry with him, you know, I thought, oh, all them years, you know, and I've lived with you and covered, covered it up. Been a, we've been a cover up, all of us. Did you kill Leslie, Susan, Malseed? I did not. Do you know anything about the murder? No. Well, only what was I read at the time. Castry was very nervous and agitated in the interviews. I have no knowledge. Well, I've certainly never never met this dead girl or any member of her family. <coughs> and I have no knowledge as to how you, you come to, say, a sample of my DNA is found at that place, especially after 30 years. He never offered a rational, reasonable, plausible explanation. Ronald Castry was charged with Leslie's murder the following day. His trial began at Bradford Crown Court almost a year later, on October the 22nd, 2007. I so wanted this, I wanted to look at him, I wanted to, you know, this is the man that had killed my sister. Uh, and this is the last face that Lil had seen and what he'd done to her and oh, I was so ready for it. He sat there with his glasses on the end of his nose, like he used to do when we were growing up, arms folded and he showed no remorse whatsoever. The trial brought two families, both destroyed by Ronald Castry, face to face for the first time. We all thought that the thing with the scum of the earth. You know, at the end of the day, I'm still walking. I'm still alive. You know, I'm his son and I'm still alive. How dare I be? But when we met Leslie's family, you know, there were no animosity there. Our biggest fear as a family was that Bentley knew what uh, Castry had done, and we were really apprehensive about that. It meant a lot to us because you do hear that the wife knows, uh, and the police reassured us that she didn't. So our guard went down, and our hearts just go out to them. They all put their arms around us, you know, and, and they said, "You go out there, Bev. You've done no wrong. You go out there and hold your head up." At the end of the third week, the jury were sent out to reach their verdict. I felt physically sick. I knew this was it. Make or break, this was it. I thought I was going to pass away. It was so tense. I remember sitting and simply putting my face to the floor, listening. I did, don't think I looked at the foreman of the jury at the time uh, he gave the verdict. And uh, when he said guilty, it was just a, a fabulous uh, feeling of, of relief, I think, really. I could feel the tension going out of my body. My first memories of April, Laura and Julie letting out a gasp of yes and the very obvious look of elation on their faces. And that was a very proud moment. All I heard was guilty. And it was just like a, a weight being lifted off my shoulders. You know, oh, thank God. Because right up until that last second, we still, there was just that little inkling. We thought, he's going to get off. He's going to get away with it. He's crafty. We are relieved that after so long, our quest for justice for Leslie is now over. It has been a long and harrowing ordeal, and our gratitude to the friends, family, and strangers throughout the world who have given us their support is immense. Ronald Castry was sentenced to life in prison and told he must serve a minimum of 30 years. I would like to think that the conviction of Ronald Castry demonstrates that West Yorkshire Police do get the man. We knew how badly things had gone wrong in the past, so to finally take such a strong case to Bradford Crown Court and to say, here we are now, 2007 as the conviction was, we're still at this, we're still looking for the man and we've convicted him. That meant a lot to us. I have nothing but contempt for Ronald Castry. He has ruined the lives of Leslie's family. He's ruined the lives of his own family and that of Stefan Kishko's. You wonder how anybody could live knowing that he'd killed a child and knowing that he'd seen somebody else go to prison for 16 years for that. It must have had an effect on him. I can't change who my dad is. I wish I could, but I can't. I can't erase the past. I wish I could. It tears me apart some days. The only thing we can do is take one day at a time. You know, if people can try and understand 
that we, we weren't any part of Ron's sick life. We were just innocent victims, same as everybody else, and give us a chance to rebuild our lives. For Leslie's family, after such a long fight for justice, it's hard to face the future. When Leslie died, I died. A living kind of a death. I just completely and utterly killed every emotion that I had. And I'm still the same today. I'm not the person I was born to be. I had to learn to live, deal with very horrific things. And it does do something to you. There's no closure. There never will be closure. Just the satisfaction that he's behind bars, he's not going to do this to anybody else, and he has been caught. We have to process the last 32 years, and uh, Arlel's never going to come home, no matter how you play this. She'll never come home. <laughs>